You can open your Bible to Ephesians 5 again, if you would. We are in a, in a study of the book of Ephesians. If you are visiting today, I'll just bring you up to speed real quick. We're talking about the practice of the believer. In other words, uh, in the book of Ephesians, as we've worked our way through it, in the first three chapters, Paul talked about doctrine. And he talked about who we are in Christ and, and what we have in Christ. And so that was the first three chapters. Then you go to the last three, which is chapters 4, 5, and 6. And in those chapters, Paul explains how we live that out. So you have doctrine in the first three. You have duty in the last three. And so we have been coming through this study of uh, looking at how we are to live our lives. And, and there is so much here. And what we're going to talk about today, it's, it breaks my heart to just look at a few verses because all of this ties together, but we don't have the time. So what we will do is we will take a little chunk today and then we'll come back and, and in two weeks, not next week, next week we'll be on Father's Day, but then in two weeks and we'll come back and we'll gather this together again. But we have, uh, two weeks ago, we looked at a message that dealt with redeeming the time. I want you to notice verses 15 and 16. Here's what is said in Ephesians 5. It says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now, we talked about what it means to redeem the time. It doesn't mean that we fill our lives up to the maximum with everything that we can possibly get so that there is not one free minute of time. That is not the idea here. The idea here is this, that when God puts opportunities before us, we seize those opportunities. We seize them. And I want to stop for a moment, and I want to explain something that we've been looking at on Wednesday nights, that I, maybe I should have connected it all with this and given you verses for that, but I'll just give you an overview there is an underlying theme in the Bible that, uh, that shows the purpose of God. And that is this, that in all things, God is to be glorified. He is to be glorified. That is, that is God's purpose today. That is, the, in everything that happens, that's the theme of the Scriptures. And there is verse after verse to back that up. So with that said, you keep that, I'll keep that at the front of your mind as we go through this today, that God is to be glorified. And that, that means this, that there are times in life when, times, when life is extremely uncomfortable. And there are times when life, there is the high pressure situations. There are situations that are heartbreaking in life. And in all of that, it is God's desire that we live in a way and that we handle those situations in a way that glorifies him so that and by that whenever i say god is glorified i mean that he is made known we are here as his representatives we that are believers we are here as his representatives and that is my responsibility to make god known to a lost and a dying world and so one of the ways that he does that is he takes me down paths sometimes that i really don't want to go down and to feel pain that i really don't want to feel it can be emotional pain it can be physical pain whatever it might be but that's what god does you see he's more concerned listen to this he's more concerned about his glory than he is our comfort our comfort is coming later our comfort comes in eternity although he is faithful to comfort us now when we go through those times but you've got to understand that it's our responsibility to be surrendered to him in those times so that when people see us, they will see him. That's probably the best way to boil it right down. So going back to redeeming the time. So when there are opportunities that come before us, we are to, we are to redeem those opportunities. We are to, in other words, that means to buy them up. In other words, don't let them get away and serve God in those opportunities so that we glorify him. Then he goes on in verse 17. Watch this verse. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now, we looked at that, and I want to stretch that out a little bit here this morning. So we redeem the time. We buy up the opportunities that come before us. But when you combine it with verse 17, 
what you have to understand is this you buy it up if it's God's will if it is his will because there are times when there are things that are set before us that are not of God they are not they are, God has God is God is not in it he's not that he's not brought that and so we have to go back to what verse 17 says understanding what the will of the Lord is don't be unwise but be understanding make sure that you know that it's in the will of God because when when we seize a moment that is in an opportunity that is outside the will of God and then what that does is that can leave that can come with consequences that we may feel and experience for the rest of our lives a really good example I, I, I don't say a good example maybe I ought to say uh, just an example that would be Abraham in Genesis 16 1 through 3 this the background for this is it would be this that Abraham desired a son that God had promised so much and Sarah was barren Sarah was barren she was unable to have children because God had not allowed her as of yet he would but not as of yet to be able to have children and Abraham Abram's getting old and so this opportunity comes it says in Genesis 16 1 through 3 now Sarah Abram's wife bare him no children and she had a handmaid an Egyptian whose name was Hagar and Sarah said unto Abram behold now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing I pray thee go in unto my maid it may be that I may obtain children by her and Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai let me just tell you something that was not God's will that was not but Abram wanted a child so much and here his wife his wife Sarai presents to him this beautiful young Egyptian girl and says look Abram I'm not able to have children why don't you take her and he never prayed about it it seems as though in verse 2 that he never thought about it very much at all he just hearkened to her voice it's just like he said yeah that's a good idea and later found out that it wasn't verse 3 and Sarah Abram's wife took Hagar or maid the Egyptian after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan and he gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife listen she would conceive Hagar would conceive if you're not familiar with the Old Testament I will spring you up to speed she would conceive and she would bear a son by the name of Ishmael he would be the father of the Arab nations you want to know how deep consequences run today the terrorist groups the majority of them come from that act right there they come from that that's what I'm saying you make sure we we redeem the time but make sure it's in the will of God and another one came to my mind and I wanted to show you this because th this is so important because you got to learn to separate your feelings out of the situation because you and I can want something so much that we are willing to ignore what the Word of God says in order to get it or just seek or, or just go into a situation where we don't even seek God's will and we don't even pray about it and so we end up in a situation that we should not be in because we seized a moment that was not of God Joshua chapter 9 real quick and I, I want to get you through this because I want to get to where we're going today Joshua chapter 9 there Joshua is gonna meet a group of people that is and we talked about this and I can't remember if this was on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning so if I'm repeating here you just nod your head like you did and never heard it before we'll go through it Joshua is gonna meet a group of people known as the Gibeonites the inhabitants of Gibeon now listen to me when when Israel came in the land of Canaan God had given them a military manual to tell them how to handle the people of the land and there were certain groups of people that were in the heart of the land that was to be uh, the, the, the divided up for the inheritance those people that lived in those cities they were to be they were to be put to death everything that had life everything that had breath was to be exterminated you say that's pretty harsh well God went on in the military manual to, to tell why that is because he said if any of them live then what will happen is that you will you will get you will incorporate their worship of these false gods in with the worship of me and that's exactly what happened they Israel didn't do what they were supposed to and 
So one of the groups that was to be exterminated was a group known as the Gibeonites. Somehow, some way, they found out about the military manual. So they come up with this deceptive plan. Let me show it to you. Watch this. Joshua 9, 3 through 6, 8, 9, and 12 through 15. Uh, didn't, I didn't want to take time to give you all the verses, but I'll give you the highlights. It says, And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and to Ai, they did work wily, and went and made as if they had been ambassadors, and took old sacks upon their asses and wine bottles, old and rent and bound up, and old shoes and clouded upon their feet, and old garments upon them, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua to the camp of Gilgal. Now let me just tell you what they did. They knew what the military manual said about them. They knew that. They knew they were to be exterminated. They knew what happened to Jericho. They knew what happened to Ai. And so they worked wily in the fact that they took old clothes and they took moldy bread and they took old shoes that were worn out. And they put the old shoes on. They put the, the old clothes on. They took the moldy bread and they come dragging into, they came, they came dragging into Gilgal, they came dragging into camp. And they said, look, We've come from afar off because they knew that those cities that were afar off were to be approached with peace and give them an opportunity to surrender to Israel, but not the ones in close. And so these people knew that they were to be exterminated. And so they come dragging into Gilgal and they made it like they were ambassadors that had been sent from the city that was afar off. Let me pick it up in verse six again. And they went to Joshua under the camp at Gilgal and said unto him and to the men of Israel, we, be, we come from a far country. See what they do? See what they say? Therefore, make ye a league with us. Make a treaty. Look, let's enter into a peace treaty. And they said unto Joshua, we are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, who are ye? And from whence come ye? And they said unto him, from a very far country thy servants are come because of the name of the Lord thy God. And we have heard the fame of him and all that he did in Egypt. This is our bread we took hot. See, watch this. They're showing it to him. This is our bread we took hot for our provision out of our houses on the day that we came forth to go unto you. But now, behold, it is dry and moldy. And these bottles of wine which we filled were new. And behold, they are rent. And these, our garments and our shoes are become old by reason of the very long journey. They said, look at our clothes. Look with your eyes. Look at the bread. Look at the wine skins. You can tell that we have come from a long distance. And here's what happened. Joshua and the, and the leaders of Israel seized that moment and they made a treaty. They never sought the will of God in the midst of that. They didn't do it. And they found out later that they had been deceived and there was nothing they could do. The, the treaty was the treaty in that situation. And so you say, well, that, was that really a big deal? Yeah, it was. Because 400 years later, 400 years later, because of what happened there, seven innocent men would die. Seven innocent men would die because of what happened here. I say all that to say this. We are to redeem the time, but make sure what you are, what you are seizing is the will of God. Because if not, the consequences may follow you for the rest of your life. You say, well, okay, then how can I know the will of God? And we talked about this a couple weeks ago, and, and I'll just give you one, one uh, passage here. To, this is probably one of the main ones. I would say this. Number one, search the word of God. Number two, surrender. That's what I want you to see here. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this. Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Here's what he's asking. He's asking, he's, he's exhorting them to give themselves over as a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice, but a living one. In other words, whenever he says, present your bodies, that's every part of your life. Give yourselves over to God. Now watch the result, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, okay, so make sure that, that you stay separated from the world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here we go. Here comes the reason. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will 
of God. That's one way to find out the will of God, by surrender. If you want to know what the will of God is for you, if you have a situation before you and you don't know, then you seek God. And I can assure you, He will reveal that to you through His Word, impress it upon your mind or whatever the situation might be. You say, well, what if it gets away? Well, then if it gets away, then I say this, then then it was not meant to be to begin with. So back to the whole thing. That's what, we're lo- that's what we were looking at, that we are to redeem the time but we are to, and, and seize the moments, but we are to make sure those moments are connected and they are of the will of God. And in all of that, let me say this before I move on. Be careful of the feelings because you can just get so determined that you want something that you become blinded to all the warning signs. You become blinded to that. Don't make the call. Don't make the, the decision based on what you see like Israel did. They looked at the clothes. They looked at the shoes. They looked at the wineskins. They looked at the bread. But they never looked to God. Understand that. Don't make it based on what you see with your eyes. Don't make your decision based on your feelings and your emotions. Seek the will of God. Now, Paul's going to continue, and he's going to show us in the next verses the will of God for each of our lives. Now, there are certain things in life that are that the will of God for you is different than it is for me, and it's different for me than it is for you. But there are certain things that we can know for sure is the will of God for each of our lives. And the first one is this, to be filled with the Spirit. That's the will of God for our lives, to be filled with the Spirit. Watch, if you would, verse 18. Watch what he says. He's going to draw a a contrast here. He says, and be not drunk with wine. Uh, Let let me stop for, let me read it all, and then I'll go back to that. We're in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, why, why would he say, be not drunk with wine? What's What's the idea there? Okay, let me explain something to you. These people would have understood, just like we do, that if somebody takes in a tremendous amount of strong drink, uh, then the wine, whenever it's, whenever it's consumed, eventually the alcohol floods the system, the bloodstream, and once the alcohol gets in the bloodstream, then the alcohol controls the individual. He said, don't be that way, but be this way. Be filled with the Spirit. In other words, just as the alcohol would would control somebody that is intoxicated, in the same way, let the Spirit control you. That's what he's saying. That's the idea right here. Be be filled with the Spirit. Be Spirit-filled. Be Spirit-controlled. That's what he's saying. He's telling us that. Now, what you need to understand is this, that as believers, we that know Christ as Savior, we have two options. You have two natures in you if you know Christ as Savior. If you are not saved, you don't have two natures. You don't have an option. But I'm talking about he's writing to believers. Believers have two options. Number one is this. You can be controlled by the sin nature or the flesh. That's... The, that's one. The sin nature and the flesh are one. So that would be the old nature. Or once you got saved, you were given the Spirit of God that now lives within you, and you can be controlled by Him. And that's what we're to be. That, that's what it is to be filled with the Spirit. So listen, here's what you need to know, that if you know Christ as Savior, there is a battle in your life, and the battle is between those two natures, for the throne that exists within your heart. Because the sin nature still wants to control you. And it is a battle each and every day. The divine nature also longs to control you. The new nature that God has given to you. The Spirit of God that is within you. He wants to sit on a throne in your, in your life. Let me show you something from the Old Testament. In Genesis 25, 20 through 23, you see a picture of it here. It says, And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife and the daughter of Bethul, the Syrian of Padamaran, the sister of Laban the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife. In other words, he prayed because she was barren. 
And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children, plural, she had twins, struggled within her. And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and the two men or a people shall be separated from thy bowels, and one people shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. Let me just tell you, let me, let me bring that into our lives, if I could. The picture in that is that's the picture of the two natures that exist within the, the believer, those that are saved, us that know Christ as Savior. This is a picture of the struggle that goes on. Just as those two children struggled within her womb, so within you and I there are these two natures that struggle together. The old nature wants to be the captain. The divine nature wants to rule over the old nature. And here it says, when God says something very interesting here, it says, the elder shall serve the younger. That was, that was backward in those days. Usually the younger served the elder. But the picture is this, that our, that, that our young nature is the Holy Spirit because he came along long after the sin nature that we have. And so we are to live in a way that the younger serves the, uh, the elder serves the younger. In other words, we are to live in a way that we don't let the flesh rule our lives anymore, but instead we are controlled by the Spirit of God. And, and we have, an, we have a, a, an, an option now. Before salvation, you didn't have an option. Now we have an option. And now the Spirit of God wants to be the captain of your life. And this is a command because that, that, that option is there. It's a command. It's a choice that we make. Be not drunk with wine. We're in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That is a direct command to you and I. This is the way that I am to live. I am to allow the Spirit of God to control me, not to follow my flesh. The flesh still wants to live and, and, and control my life completely. And he longs for the things that are sinful. But the Spirit of God longs for the things that are righteous. He longs for the things that belong unto God. And now, in my life, since I have been saved, now there is an option. Let me show you something. Romans 7, 15, 16 and 20, through 21. Watch the struggle. This was in Paul's life. He said, for that which I do, I allow not. I'll explain this to you. For what I would, that I do not. That do I not, but what I hate, that do I. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me I find then a law, that when I would do evil, ever, evil is present with me. Now listen to me. The Apostle Paul went through a time in his life and he said, what I want to do, I don't do, and what I don't want to do, I do. You ever been there? You ever been there in your life when there's something, there's a habit, there's something in your life, and, and you just want to get rid of that. You want to be free of it. And, and you notice that there is a going back to that. You'll be, you may break free from it for a long time, and maybe for several weeks or several months, and you think, well, I'm free from that. And all at once, out of nowhere, you give in to that again. And you have that struggle. And, and with Paul, you say this, what I want to do, I don't do, and what I don't want to do, I do. And, I, and then you hate the fact that you've given in to that temptation, whatever it might be, and you hate it. That's that struggle between the two natures. That's what it is. And that's what the command is here. Don't give in to the old nature be controlled by the, be filled with the Spirit. Let the Spirit of God fill you because now you have the ability to say no to the flesh. You don't have to give in to that old temptation anymore. You don't have to give in to that. You don't have to give in to the flesh and the desires of the flesh. You no longer have to do that. You had to before. That's all you knew before you were saved. But now you don't have to do it anymore. But I want to raise a question. What is life like when you are controlled by the flesh? What's it like? What's it, what's it, what's, 
what am I to expect and experience? First of all, let me, let me give you two things that it's not. Number one, it is not an emotional experience. So it's not something that, that you whip up your emotions about in order to uh, be controlled by the Spirit. And it's not only for certain believers. This command's given to everybody. To be filled with the Spirit is a lifestyle in which we deny the desires of the flesh. You desire or you deny those things that the old nature wants you to grab onto. You, you deny those things. You allow the Holy Spirit to control you instead of that old sin nature that you once had. Because now the sin nature has been defeated because of what Jesus did. Let me show you that in Romans 6. 6, 6, and 11 through 13 and 20 and 22. Paul wrote this, knowing this, that our old man, that's the sin nature, is crucified with him, with Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. See that? It's a command. Don't let sin reign. You don't, you don't have to give in to those temptations anymore. You don't have to do that. There's no longer a, a need for you to do that. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as unto, unto, uh, unto those that are alive from the dead and members of instruments of, of righteousness unto God. For when ye were the servants of sin, see that when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness, but now being made free from sin and become servants of God, you have your fruit unto holiness in the end everlasting life. So the part that I want you to understand is this, that you don't have to give in to that old nature anymore. You don't need to do that. You don't need to ride that roller coaster where you say, I don't, what I want to do, I don't do, and what I, what I want to do, I don't do, and what I don't want to do, I do. You don't, have to, you don't have to go through that anymore because now you have been given the power of the, the, because of the Spirit that lives within you, and because we have been crucified with Christ, the flesh has lost his power. And now we can yield, and that's a very key word, we can yield to the Spirit in our lives. Listen to the words of Woodrow Kroll, if you would. Here's what he says, and I quote, When we fail to yield ourselves completely to him, we quench the Holy Spirit. Now, do you know what it means to quench the Spirit of God? It doesn't mean that we extinguish him as you would quench or extinguish a fire. It means that we stifle him. We stifle his influence in our lives. It's very possible for us to be cleansed of every sin except unyieldedness. And if this is so, we cannot be filled with the Spirit of God. So make sure that you unreservedly yield yourself to God for whatever He wants from you. Just be transparent and open before Him, unquote. It's what God wants. He wants us to be yielded to Him. He wants us to be surrendered to to him so that he can use you and I for his glory. That's what he wants. That's the purpose. And so there is that struggle within us. But we have been given the power to overcome the flesh. And so I no longer need to give in to the flesh. I don't. There was a time whenever we were servants of sin and we were free from righteousness, but now we're dead to sin because we've been crucified with Christ. As Paul goes on now, this, he, he makes it a little bit easier for us to get our mind wrapped around. He's going to show you what a spirit-filled life looks like practically. And the first thing that he's going to show us is this, that the person that is spirit-filled has a joyful heart, a joyful heart. Watch, if you would, verse 19. He goes on, let, let me read 18, because they run right together. Be not drunk with wine, we're in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking, okay, see the connection just flows right in, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. 
Okay, so there's a lot to be said about that verse, but I'm going to kind of condense it down for you if I could. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. In other words, when a person is spirit-filled, they will desire to talk about what they learn in the Word of God. I've, I've learned that. They will, they will have a desire to fellowship over the truths of God's Word. But I, but I go to the end of that, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And I say this, that when a person is spirit-filled, they will have a heart that is full of joy. And it will be a joy that will be unable to be contained. You ever been around one of those people? They're just joyful. Boy, they're, they're just so much fun to be around. It doesn't matter what happens in their lives. They're all about the joy. They're all about the joy because... They are spirit-filled individuals, and so they go through life, and they deal with problems. It doesn't mean that they never shed a tear. It doesn't mean that they don't have heartache in their life. It doesn't mean that, but it means that there is joy deep down within their heart, and that comes from that spirit-filled life. That's what the world's looking for. That's what a lot of people in the church are looking for today, but they don't know where to get it, and so they try so many things. In churches today, they offer so much entertainment and so many programs and, and this and that, and we're going to do this this week, and we're going to do this. And, and so they dress up the, the services, and they do all kinds of things. But listen, that's not where it's found. It's found in a relationship with Christ, and it's found being filled with the Spirit, yielded to the Spirit, yielded over to Him, giving Him your life and letting Him control you and then the closer you get to christ the more of that joy there is let me take you to john 15 on the screen if i could watch this 5 to 11 jesus said i am the vine here the branches he that abideth in me and i in him the same bringeth forth much fruit for without me he can do nothing if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified. That you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love, these things have I spoken unto you, watch this, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. A heart full of joy is the result of a, a person being filled with the Spirit, controlled by the Spirit of God. Spirit of God. And, and, and I'll say this, the person that is, that is controlled by the Spirit of God and, and that joy comes from their lives, they don't find that joy in circumstances. They don't find it in the things that happen in this life because that's changing all the time. And if you're going to base your joy upon how your life goes, I can assure you this, that there's going to be times when you're going to be on a huge roller coaster because sometimes things kind of fall into place and there are other times where things kind of fall apart. And when they fall apart, if you're looking for joy in circumstances, you're not going to get it there. You're not going to get it. It's all going to fall apart and you're going to be miserable in your life. But in Christ... Right here, in Him, abiding in Him, serving Him, walking in fellowship with Him, bearing fruit for Him, then there is a joy that remains in you, and it is a joy that will fill you to the brim and even flow out into the lives of other individuals. That's what we need to be shooting for. That's why Paul says, Be not drunk with wine, we're in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit, so that that joy will come from our lives. And God will be glorified. The next one also glorifies God. A person that is spirit-filled is a person with a thankful heart. Watch verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The spirit-filled person isn't a complainer or a grumbler. They know there are people that know how to count their blessings. And they will go about their days praising God for His goodness. Sure, there are struggles. 
Sure, there are trials, there are storms, but they don't dwell on those. They don't dwell on those storms. They will enjoy the blessings in the moment, in the moment that they are in. And if there are nothing at the present moment that they can rejoice over, then they will reflect back to something else because they are spirit-filled, or they will reflect ahead, knowing that the storm has only come to pass. It has not come to stay. That it will only be there for a time. The pain in the heart will only exist for a period of time. God will send the comfort, and it will heal, and life will go on. They can look ahead to eternity and know that there will be a day when this life will be behind us because this individual doesn't focus on the negative they focus on the positive and they give thanks always for all things unto God they just have a thankful heart they praise God for the breath that they have they praise him for the water one time I went to a guy's house and he said would you like a glass of water and I said sure that'd be fine and so we sat down at the table, and I grabbed the glass, and I went to drink. He said, hold it. I thought, well, I wonder what's wrong with the water. He said, we got to thank the Lord for that water before you consume it. He was thankful for every little thing that he had, everything. Let me go back to something. Remember what I said, that we are here to glorify God. It's the underlying theme of the Bible, that God will be glorified. And so he takes us down paths and through storms and through valleys, sometimes mountaintop experiences, sometimes those things. But whatever he takes us through, it is to glorify him. And when you go through the storms with a thankful heart, I can assure you, you glorify him because that's not what the world does. The world, in the midst of those storms or in the midst of the trials, they look for a way to get even. They look for a way to retaliate to the person who maybe has caused the storm, to the person who has said something or done something. And their whole focus is to make that person feel the same pain that they feel. See, that's the old nature, in case you didn't know that. When somebody hurts you, when somebody does something that causes you pain, it is the old nature, it is the sin nature that says to you, let's make them feel the same pain that you're feeling. That's being controlled by the sin nature. The Holy Spirit says this. You know that person that hated you, that did this, that caused this in your life? Let's love them. Let's show them the love of God, an unconditional love. That's the difference. Let's be thankful for what we have. Let us count our blessings as we go through these trials. Remember this, remember this, remember what God has done here, remember what he's done there. That's the spirit-filled person. That's the person that glorifies God with the way they handle the difficulties of life. Psalm 34, 1 through 3 says this, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Beautiful psalm, perfect setting for what we're looking at. Psalm 100, 1 through 5 Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Just verse after verse after verse in the Bible of being thankful. But that is what the Spirit-filled person does. They praise God. They thank God. They count their blessings. They count their blessings. They have a joyful heart. They have a thankful heart. There's another one. 
They have a submissive heart. They have a submissive heart. Watch, if you would, uh, verse 21. Submitting yourselves to what, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Just stop right there. Just hold on. Now, next, when we come back to this, we'll pick this up because if you notice what he says next, he's going to go on and talk about relationships and the importance of submission. He goes, watch verse 22, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife. And, and he goes on. And, and, and so uh, he's going to take that and he's going to bring that into our lives. But I, I want to go back to that for a moment. Submitting yourselves one to another. Let, let me give you something that, uh, that Paul had uh, recorded in 1 Corinthians. Uh, I'll kind of pull a picture together here for you if I could. He says this when talking about the body of Christ. He says, 1 Corinthians 12, 25-26, he says that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Uh, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. So I use that just to remind you of this, that we are we that know Christ as Savior, we are the body of Christ. We function together. We function together. We don't work against one another. Just take the human body. Okay? Your feet work together when you walk your hands work together when you are working your your just your members of your body they they work together they don't work against one another that's the idea okay but i want to go on with that if i could watch ephesians 4 now watch this 1 through 3 paul said i therefore the prisoner of the lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called with all lowliness and meekness long suffering forbearing one another in love. And here's what I want to focus on. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now listen to me. We are to, in the church, we are to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We are to do everything we can to keep unity here in the body of Christ. With one exception. We never compromise the truth to get unity. We never do. I've given you this statement before, and I will say it again. Unity at the expense of truth is treason to Jesus Christ. So we don't, in order to get unity, we do not compromise the truth. We do not say, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to set my doctrine aside just so we can come together in unity. We don't do that. We can't do that. That's treason. We don't do that. But we do, when we agree on the Scriptures and we agree on our doctrines, then we endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit because we are, we are one body, we function together, and this, the whole group, the, the entire body is supposed to work together going back to that underlying theme to glorify God. That's what we are here for. God could have saved us and taken us right out of the world, right away, and taken us into His presence, but He didn't do that. He left us here. Why? Because we are his ambassadors here, and as his ambassadors, we represent Christ to a lost and a dying world. And so we, in order to magnify him, which is to glorify God, make him known, we keep the unity, we function together as a body. Okay, now bring into that submission. Bring into that submission. We have to be willing, listen, in any relationship, one of the keys to making a relationship work is submission, not dominance, not a domineering spirit, but one of the keys to, to a healthy, functioning relationship is submission, whether it, be in the, whether it be the family or whether it be the church. There's got to be submission. We can't go through life thinking that we have all the answers. We can't go through life thinking that we are better than others. We're not to do that. We are not to do that. We are to be willing to submit. Listen to the words of John Phillips. He says this, 
the key to each relationship is submission. The kind of submission, now listen to this, the son yielded to the father when he lived on earth as a man. Let me stop there and then I'll go back to Philip's words. We are to be submissive, first of all, to God. We're to be submissive to His will. We're to be submissive to the path that God has ordained for me to walk. That glorifies Him. When I accept it, and I go back to what I said at the risk of repeating myself over and over again, but sometimes it's not an easy path. Sometimes it's a painful path. But I have to submit because God knows far better than I do. On Wednesday night, we talked about something with Esther that I found to be a, a, just a real blessing for my life. We talked about the fact that when Esther was taken into the harem of uh, King Ahasuerus, that it appears as though by one word in Esther chapter 2 verse 8, it is the word brought that can mean seized by force, that she didn't have a choice. Esther didn't have a choice. She was taken by the king's men because they gathered all the young, beautiful virgins to be in the harem of the king. One of them, after, after each one would spend one night with the king as he would satisfy his own personal desires, he would pick one of those girls. Esther didn't want to sign up for that. But God allowed that to happen. And in the moment, she couldn't see beyond that moment that she was in, that on down the road, that there was going to be a man by the name of Haman that was going to have a hatred for the Jews, and he was going to get the king to endorse a law of the Medes and the Persians that is irreversible, that all the Jews were to be put to death. She didn't know that. She had no clue. All she knew was at that time, she didn't want to be drafted in to that harem. She didn't want that. I'm guessing. I'm adding to it. I don't know. I don't think she would have. Little Jewish girl, late teens, taken into this harem. And if you didn't get picked as the queen, then you became a part of the king's harem. And you may never get caught in, called into the presence of the king again. And, and, and you were never free to go out and marry on your own. You were always a concubine of the king, which was a second-class wife. Who wants to sign up for that? But anyhow, probably not something she would have chosen. But God could see beyond the moment. God could see down the road. And I've got to remember in my life that there are times when the path is hard. It is very difficult. But I can only see the moment that I'm in. That's it. I can't even see this evening, let alone tomorrow or next week or next month or next year can't see beyond the moment I'm in. So you know what I got to do? I got to trust him. He left it happen. He allowed it to happen. We looked at, I believe it's Psalm 46 on Wednesday night. Be still and know that I am God. It's a hard verse. It's an easy verse to quote. It's a hard verse to live. Be still. When it's not going your way, God says, be still. Stop fighting. Stop fighting. Stop resisting. Because God's ways are not our ways, and His ways are far above our ways. And so that comes back to the submission, submitting to Him. But that's not what this says here. This says submitting yourselves one to another in the body of Christ. So it starts by submitting to God. Let me go back to Philip's words again. I'll read the whole paragraph. The key to each relationship is submission, the kind of submission the son yielded to the father when he lived on the earth as a man. There, you want to talk about a hard path, 
His path led directly to the cross. But let me go on. That kind of submission, so often contrary to human nature, is an evidence of the filling of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will drive us in submission by the pressure of human relationships. It may take time, but eventually we learn that the path of submission is best. We learn to fall in line with the will of the Holy Spirit, unquote. That's what we are to do. That's what we are to do. But we submit to one another. We don't fight against one another in the body of Christ. We don't do that. We don't do that. We live to honor and to glorify God. So going back to the being filled with the Spirit again, three things will be evident in your life. One, you will have a joyful heart. Two, you will have a thankful heart. Three, you will have a submissive heart. So I give you that and I say this. Take that and bring it alongside your life and examine your life. And, and I'll ask you this, how you doing as far as being filled with the Spirit? That last one's the tough one, isn't it? We can, you can really, you can fake the first two if you so desired that joy. You can kind of put on a front. You can put on a front with thankfulness. But that third one is the trier, isn't it? Get you, just let something back you in a corner. Let the path before you be painful. And you'll know in a hurry, really quick, whether you are filled with the Spirit. The bottom line is this. We are commanded to be filled with the Spirit, to let the Spirit of God sit on the throne in our hearts. It is a choice. It is a choice. But keep in mind, as I close out today, keep this in mind. Again, when you leave here, if you get nothing else today, I want you to get this that your goal, that, that your focus in life ought to be that underlying theme of God's Word, that in all I do, I am to glorify God. I am to make Him known to the people around me. And that means I'm going to handle things differently than what the world does because if I'm going to be filled with the Spirit, I'm going to be different. And that's what God wants. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Lord, there is a lot here. But Lord, practically speaking, Paul lays it out that we are to be filled with the Spirit. We are to be controlled by the Spirit. And when we are, there will be three evidences in our lives. We will have a joyful heart. Father, we will have a thankful heart. And Father, we will have a submissive heart. Lord, help each one of us to examine where we are in our walk. Are we controlled by the Spirit or am I controlled by the flesh? Do I have joy in my heart? Am I thankful for the blessings that I have? Am I submissive to you, starting with you, and to what you would have for me, and then submissive to other people? Father, might we be honest with ourselves? Might we be honest? Lord, if there's changes that need to be made, help us to be quick to make them. Help us to get to the place where we are yielded to you to be filled with the Spirit. Take the message and use it for your honor and for your glory, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.